listening to Give God 90, where we're not afraid of the tough biblical questions, because we will dig through the language, the culture, and the history to find the truth revealed in the words of our Creator. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for sharing part of your day with us. My name is Jerry Mitchell. Sitting in her supervisor's chair is Myra. Hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> She's over there giving me hand signals before we get started. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you're new here, we thank you. If you've been here for a while, welcome back. Uh, might want to check out the website. I did add something this week. If you're interested in the book, there's a link on there that will take you right. It's from the publisher. The new videos there, all that good stuff is on there. Um <clears throat> By the way, check out that website. There's a lot of good stuff on there. I get a lot of people asking, uh, you know, how do we get more? How do I know more? Well, there's like four years of archived podcasts. But if you, you know, and there are people who ask for videos, and that's fine. If you're looking for videos, there's links on the website. Um, check out the YouTube channel. It's under Jerry Mitchell. It's not under Give God 90. Uh, it, all that stuff's there if you want it. Um, and I say that kind of offhanded in a little bit of a way. Uh, I'm starting to get some requests for people that want me to speak, and I, that's wonderful. I will do that uh, if when time allows. And it doesn't matter to me whether you want me to go to you or uh, come to you through Zoom or some other type of media like that, that's that's fine too. We can work those things out. And uh, I really appreciate people. And it's, it sounds strange that people want to hear what I say. Nobody's ever wanted to listen to me before. <laughs> but okay. You know, and, and the reason is, you know, I'm the youngest. I have three older brothers. Uh, the next older brother's 10 years older than I am. And uh, so, you know, I was the kid. I was the one that nobody listened to. I'm kind of used to that. <laughs> but now it seems that um, as long as I'm basically repeating what's in Scripture, people are interested, which is a good thing. I, I can live with that. Uh, if you like what you hear, you know, hit the share buttons. Subscribe works too, okay, wherever you're listening to or whatever platform you're listening on. Uh, the likes we really like, uh, comments. A lot of you are finding us on various social media. We appreciate that. Keep them coming. We really like hearing what you say. Uh, and, and I really like the questions too. Uh, like this week, (laughs) something I said, and I kind of said it in passing. Uh, I, I made a comment that, uh, I had passed a sign that said, just believe, right? Apparently that affected some of you because I got some messages about that this week. Um, And, and uh, I guess there's folks out there that, you know, are confused about that. So I want to dig into that a little bit. And I've said before that faith is trust and that trust requires action, right? You know, every day around the world, people uh, hand a credit card or use a credit card to purchase things. And they trust that their transaction will be secure and everything will work. They've never met any of the folks that, you know, do those things. Right, they they might know uh, the person they're they're making the purchase from. It might be a local store, might be online. You might not know who that person is. You certainly don't know everybody in the bank that's involved with it, but you trust that that transaction will go through. You know, someone uh, will look at a chair and and they're going to trust that that chair is not going to break when you sit on it. Maybe they trust a bed is comfortable when they lie on it right? Makes perfect sense. People do it every day. Think about this though, an airline passenger, an airline passenger has to trust the plane to be safe 
He has to trust the flight crew to be trained and professional so they can arrive safely at their destination. They display their trust just by boarding a plane. Even something as simple as crossing the street requires trust. Trust that you've made sure that it's safe. You're you're trusting a little bit in yourself there. Trust that you're not going to trip and fall. And if you do, you're trusting that a driver who's coming down the street will see you and they're going to stop without running over you. Children should be able to trust their parents and their teachers. They should trust them to offer them uh, correct information, correct instruction as they mature into adulthood. So why is it we're able to trust a, a chair, a bed, or a credit card company? Someone we don't know, you know, maybe they work at a bank. Maybe they're a, a pilot. Maybe it's a new doctor that you don't really have a rapport with. We trust those kind of people. Children place a lot of trust in their parent, guardian, their teachers. So why don't we choose to trust our creator? Even the the very people who claim that they believe that God created us have trouble accepting that the Bible is factual. I was speaking with someone uh, not that terribly long ago. It's, well been a while but it's not not that long ago um they said they believe the bible so i asked a a really simple question how old is the earth without hesitation without thought the answer was well about 14 billion years well i said then you don't believe your bible you know, the, they, the look on their face was classic. It, it was shock, surprise, and disbelief. They didn't think I had the audacity to call them on it. When, when we think about that, if we, choo- if we say we believe the Bible, and then we say, well, the earth is 14 billion years old, You know, you're you're falling for the same question that the serpent asked in the garden. Did God really say? Now, the other day I mentioned James two nineteen. You believe there is only one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe that, and they're terrified. Now, of course, part of that comes from Deuteronomy six four. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, right? Every Hebrew-speaking person uh, who practices their faith wakes up every morning, and the very first words out of their mouth in the morning, the very last words out of their mouth in the evening, is Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. That's not what's written, but that's what they say because they don't use the name. It's actually written, Shema Yisrael, Yehovah Eloheinu, Yehovah Okad. When you use the name, it takes all of the guesswork out of who you're talking about, right? <clears throat> the word demon, though, in James, of course, is Greek, and it uh, is Strong's number 1140, if you're keeping score. It's the word uh, diamenon, I believe is how they pronounce that. It's defined as an evil spirit, a demon, or a heathen deity. It, these are the beings that actually rebelled against the Creator. They believe in the Creator, but they're terrified. Why? They're terrified because they know the power and the authority of the Creator. These beings know the Creator exists. They know He's there. They have no doubt. They know what he can do. They know he has all the power and all the authority, but they put their trust in something else, and they display that trust by actively working against the Creator. Think about that. Myron's going to read a familiar passage about someone who displayed their complete trust in the Almighty. Go ahead and read that passage. 
After these things, God tested Abraham's faith. God said to him, Abraham. He answered, Here I am. Then God said, Take your only son Isaac, the son you love. Go to the Lamb of Moriah. There kill him and offer him as a burnt offering, as a whole burnt offering. Do this to the on one of the mountains there. I will tell you which one. Early in the morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took Isaac and two servants with him. He cut the wood for the sacrifice. Then they went to the place God had told them to go. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey. My son and I will go over there and worship. Then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the sacrifice and gave it to his son to carry. Abraham took the knife and the fire. So Abraham and his son went on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father? Abraham answered, Yes, my son. Isaac said, We have the fire and the wood, but there is no lamb we will burn as a sacrifice. Abraham answered, God will give us the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. So Abraham and his son went together. They came to the place God had told them told him about. There Abraham built an altar. He laid the wood on it. Then he tied up his son Isaac, and he laid Isaac on the wood on the altar. Then Abraham took his knife and was about to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven. The angel said, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham answered, yes. The angel said, don't kill your son or hurt him in any way. Now I see that you respect God. And I see that you have not kept your son, your only son, from me. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 12. Abraham trusted the Creator so much, he was willing to return the gift of Isaac back to him when he was asked to. Now, if you're a parent... (laughs) There may be some times as your children are growing up when you wanted to give your child back, right? When they're misbehaving, it it happens. But you don't. You wouldn't. More than likely wouldn't. I I heard a a story, um, true story, about a mother who was very distraught, very depressed, her 19-year-old son had been killed in an automobile accident. And for several months, she was just distraught, depressed, beside herself. Just, just couldn't function. A man of faith went to her. I'm not going to tell you what denomination. I'm not going to tell you what religious system he was from. But he went to her and he asked a question. He said, if God had asked you to care for this person for 19 years, to feed him, to clothe him, to teach him, to love him, would you have done it for only 19 years? And she said, no, I wouldn't do that. And without thinking, the words that come out of his mouth were, it's a good thing God didn't ask you. And then finally, she realized that she had been concentrating on the loss. She hadn't been concentrating on the time that they had had together. And, and I use these examples to show the difference that sometimes we display our faith and our trust without even knowing we're doing it. And sometimes we show our faith by making the right choices. Now, obviously, Abraham was making the right choices. This distraught mother wasn't offered a choice, but she raised her son hoping that he would become an adult who would trust the Almighty, and apparently he did. 
So what about the choices that we make every day? Do your actions show your trust in your creator or do they display your trust in something else even though you might be a believer? You might claim Christianity maybe. You may say, oh yeah, I I believe in God. I read the Bible. I, I do those things. But do you? Maybe, and I'm speaking primarily to Christians here, maybe you've been convinced that if you have accepted Jesus in your heart, you're going to go to heaven when you die. Have you ever read that in any translation in your Bible? Let me answer that for you. You have not. It's not in there. This is a modern Christian concept that comes from a couple of verses that have actually been twisted out of context. One from Revelation 3.20. It should be fairly familiar to most Christians. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Right? That's not asking him into your heart. Sorry, guys. Here's where the pastors are going to get really upset with me. Uh, because the next one comes from Romans 10.9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe, in, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Hmm. I really don't think that this particular Romans passage is going to stand the scrutiny of accuracy. There's textual variations in the Greek manuscripts that don't all agree. And quite honestly, I don't think any Hebrew writer in the first century would have written those words. Not exactly like that anyway. Um, Especially Paul, with him being as familiar with the books of Moses and the prophets as he was. We'll get to that in a second. Um, But we're going to look at this first part in context So if you want to read that Romans passage for us. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with your heart you believe and are satisfied, and with your mouth you confess and are saved. It is just as the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and gives richly to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans 10, verse 9 through 13. So you see, the verse 9, Paul almost reverses himself just a little bit. And I blame some of this on the translation out of Hebrew into Greek and out of Greek into English. So there's some confusion there. And and the use of pronouns is confusing enough in a sentence anyway. Uh, the will not be put to shame part actually comes from Isaiah 28, 13. And then, of course, we have the famous Acts 2 passage. Um, Peter is actually quoting from Joel. So instead of <laughs> instead of listening to the quote, let's just go straight back to Joel. If you want to read that Joel passage for me. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of Jehovah. And everyone who calls on the name of Jehovah will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance. As Jehovah has promised, among among the remnant called by Jehovah, Joel 2, verses 31 and 32. Now, that's part of what Peter quoted, okay? That's part of what Peter quoted. If Peter would have come up with something new and off the wall, they'd have killed him right there. There's no doubt in my mind. But think about this. It's a call to action. 
What Joel is saying and what Peter repeats is a call to action. He's saying, put your trust to work. The first call to action is to cry out. Your first display of trust is to call on the Creator and not just simply to believe. Oh, I believe. Now I'm going to keep doing the things I was doing. Right? There's no difference than what the children of Abraham did when they were in Egypt. When they found themselves no longer... Uh, the pillars of society, but now they found themselves having to work very hard. They were considered slaves in Egypt. They didn't like it. What did they do? They cried out. Actually, in Exodus 3, 9, it says the Creator heard their cries of distress. If the Creator is so willing to hear you cry out, what should your response be? To believe? You know, when Moses showed back up in Egypt after 40 years, the the children of Abraham had a choice. They could have said, no, 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 we're, we're, we're sure we're sure that God heard us, and, and we know that he's just going to speak, and we will, you know, wind up miraculously somewhere else. Um, that didn't work out quite so well for him thinking that way. They had to answer the call to action. They cried out. The Creator responded. Just like in a conversation, when somebody speaks, then the other person speaks, then the other person speaks. That's the way it works. You cry out. The Almighty responds. It's your turn again. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay in Egypt? Or are you going to walk out when it's time? You hoped that he would hear when you cried out. He does hear. What's your response? What are you going to do? You're just going to simply, okay, you're there. I know you're there. As long as I know you're there, it's okay. I'm just going to keep doing the things that got me to the point where I had to cry out to begin with. I'm going to keep being this slave to whatever it is that I'm going to be doing. I'm just going to stay here uh, in, in this hole until you yourself pick me up and move me. That's not the response he's looking for. Although many, many people do exactly that. They keep doing the things that get them to the point where they feel so low that they have to look up to see the underneath of down. And the demons do that too. They believe because they have exacting firsthand knowledge. They know, they interact, they can see the Almighty. And they're terrified and not in a good way. The demons believe, but they do not trust the Creator. They put their trust in the created. Now, here's something that's going to surprise some folks. The demons have the same opportunity to repent that we do. And some may. Some may. So are you going to be like a demon? Believing, but terrified? Or will you believe and trust the Creator, not being terrified, but by showing the fear of respect, by doing the things that He would enjoy seeing you doing, instead of doing the things you may enjoy that He disapproves of? Think about that for a second. Who, you, know, you you were at the point at some time when you cried out. He heard you. What will your response be? Are you going to walk out of where you were? 
or are you just going to sit down and and enjoy your misery? Are you willing to display your obedience to your creator? Not your obedience to a pastor, not your obedience to a denomination, not your obedience to a tradition or a parent or a spouse, but by trusting your creator by doing the things that he chooses for us to do. Worshiping him his way, celebrating his feasts, including him in all of your decisions, including him in every aspect of your life, even eating the things he chooses for us to eat and avoiding the things he instructs us not to eat. And I'm not talking about the kosher laws here, folks. I'm talking, I am strictly speaking about what's in Scripture. If you pick up your Bible and you read, don't. I, I almost said, don't worry about the kosher laws. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to get into that. But think about what's written and do what's written. What I'm really asking is, are you ready to trust him enough to walk away from any form of man-made religious system that you may be currently part of and follow his way. Not my way, not anyone else's way. His way. Are you ready to begin living the way that your creator designed you to live? Are you ready to trust him? Are you ready to say, okay, he heard me. How do I respond? Did you have anything you wanted to add to any of that? I think you said most of everything needs saying. (laughs) So thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you on Monday. Absolutely, we will. Until Monday, everyone, many, many blessings.